this is uh, Jay Horowitz with the latest edition of Amazing Mets Alumni Podcast. And my special, special guest is Mookie Wilson, a friend of, God, over 40 years. I'm old, older than Mookie, but I'm old. Mookie, <laughs> there, uh, 35 years ago this month, you wrote yourself into Mets history. Next year is the 60th anniversary of the Mets. And without a doubt, you had the most historic and meaningful at bat through all those games and all those years. How does it feel looking back, you know, 35 years later on those time in the 86 World Series? Well, uh, Jay, you know, um, it doesn't seem like it's been that long. It's like everything this yesterday because we talk about it so much. Um, the 86 team was such a uh, flamboyant team. I mean, they were really uh, an exciting team you know, to watch and to be around and you've seen the personality. So, um, just to be part of Mets history is something that's it, it's very flattering, very humbling. Um, considering you have you've had people that's come through today, you know Tom Seaver, uh, uh, you know, you know Jerry Kuzman, Nolan Ryan, and the list goes on. You know, with even some kids that were younger than I am, you know, like Strawberry and Dark, you know, uh, Keith Hernandez, Gary Carter, um, and to be part of one of the most iconic moments you know in Mets history for sure and maybe in baseball history um I appreciate it I just don't take it for granted I don't take it for granted because I understand that baseball is just a great game and just to be part of this is something that I, I treasure and as I said that's like it's been that long ago since it's been yesterday so it, it's really been a feel, good feeling for me I, I knew you had told me correct me if I'm wrong that you never watch your at bat that much after it was over you I know you watch it a little bit but this week you know, for the first time, you, you you know, ESPN just did a four-part, four-hour series on us, Once Upon a Time in Queens. You actually sat down and watched a whole four hours with your family, including your young daughters who really never had a chance to see you play. Is that correct? Oh, that's definitely correct. Um, My daughters were born in 84 and 85. Um, so they never really have an opportunity to see me actually play the game. They said, you know, they have a good memory recollection of my coaching but never playing and to sit down and, and go over the 86 team with them. I told them that there's a lot happened before the 86 team now. So don't, don't, don't think that 86 team was the only thing that ever happened. Um, but they have an appreciation for the game. They were um, softball players, so they always loved the game. And uh, to sit down with them and just to go over that whole game, including that at bat, because they've heard a lot of talk about it. People have pushed them all the time about it and they can't really say a whole lot because they don't know a whole lot. But I think they have now an, a good um, idea of what that was and how it all came to play. And no matter what you've read, you know, um, seeing it is not, it's nothing like, you know, being the eye test, you know, you're actually seeing what happened and how it happened and how everything transpired. And that's how we got to where we are today. So what did you tell me? So you come to back, uh, we were we we went to we were down by two runs, two outs, two strikes on Gary. You come to bat, we lose at five four. What did you say to them when you came up to bat against Stanley? Do you remember what you say? Look, like, here it is. This is what it is. Would well, you remember how you approached that? <laughs> no, uh, no. I I we believe it or not, in watching it with my family and stuff, we just watched the game. I didn't want to. Um, start being a commentator, you know, because um, I'm sitting there and some of the things I did, I didn't remember, um, you know. Um, so, no, it wasn't like this is all, because they've seen clips of it. So they knew how it's going to end. They just didn't know how it got to that point. So there was no need for me to be a, a commentator and go, you know, pitch for pitch and stuff. Like that. I did kind of tell them a couple of pitches that I should have hit <laughs> that I should have hit because I had a couple of really good pitches to hit and I, I fouled them all. But I, I made those little comments, but other than that, nothing. We we'll get backtrack a little bit. So we come in the bottom of the 10th, you know, this is this like iconic shot of Davey sitting with Mel in the dugout, his head down, yes. you know, two outs. You're probably the most optimistic person I've ever met in my entire life. After, I think Wally made the second out or I forget, or Kitten, the second out in the inning. I was in Davies' office sitting, and my first reaction was, how are we going to explain away we won 114 <laughs> games through the year? And honestly, not to digress, 
the other teams hated us. They we they thought yeah. we were arrogant, cocky. We got to four or five fights during the year. And I'm trying to say, how name a god we could explain away how we lost this thing. So what did you feel like? First, you know, Gary gets a hit, then uh, Kevin, and then then Kid, and you come up. I mean, what were your are you, are you what were your thoughts coming up to your, your bat that time? Well, first, Jay, before we get to the point that where I'm coming up to bat, um, I felt good. I, I felt okay because we were down too long. We've come back before. That wasn't an issue. Um, we had our probably our best two on base guys coming up. We had Wally and we had Key. And so there was still room for optimism there. Um, when Wally makes an out and Key makes an out, then things that wasn't too good. Things supposed to do good. And we're down two runs. And um, I'm saying to myself, well, you've seen the video. You've seen how David did the look on David's face, look on Mel's face. And a couple of rows, a couple of people down, I'm sitting. And I'm sitting, I'm saying to myself, we blew this. You know, I mean, what are the odds? You know, we blew this. But Gary gets a hit. Okay, so we get one hit. Two strikes get a hit. Okay, that happened. Um, <laughs> then Mitchell gets two strikes. He gets a hit. Well, there again, lightning this strike twice in the same place. No one, put, you can't predict those kind of things happen. So you know that the look is going to run out pretty soon. And then Ray Knight gets two strikes. Well, okay, this is definitely going to be it. Then he gets a hit. Now I got to go from we done blew it to I got a hit. Yeah. And <laughs> man, I, I've never been on such a roller coaster in my life like this is an up and down up and down so these guys got two strikes and two hits and um the pressure's there i mean we have three guys with two strikes and we get two hits off the closer now i got a hit then they're gonna change pitches on me they start now that i didn't like that too i mean i wanted the same guy there was no yeah. video back then mookie huh no video no no no, no no video you just had to go on what you what you remember from you no know, 10 <laughs> years ago or whatever but you know me jay i wasn't a Video guy, anyway, I was like a see it, swing at it, take your, take your best shot. That was my philosophy. That's the way I approached the game. On. And um, then I get two strikes for me right away. Now, the pressure, I got to really, I'm saying, hey, whatever you do, just don't strike out. Just don't strike. Give yourself a don't strike out. And Jay, I didn't realize how many pitches that I swung at. I didn't realize how many pitches there were. I mean, there was a lot of pitches. And, um, you know, the wild pitch, and I'm not a gambler, Jay, but you know what term? Now I'm playing with house money. I'll play with house money, Jay. I can, <laughs> I'm off the hook. Now I just got to put the ball in play and whatever happens to happen. So, you know, that's the roller coaster I was on, you know. But when the ball went, I hit the ball. I had a better pitch than I should have handled. Um, but, you know, then I hit it, and then I got to watch this slow roller go between his legs. I mean, I'm running as hard as I can, and when it goes between his legs, and then, no, I'm surprised. Everybody's surprised. It's just one of those roller coasters, man. Nobody can explain. Sixty-four thousand on a question. If it doesn't go through Bill's legs, do you beat the ball out? You asked that question. I think in the past year, that's been the question that I have had to answer many, many, many times. And um, I answered this way: Bill and I sat down and we watched this play, you know, numerous times, and we discussed it. And we both agreed that even if he catch that ball, you know, he's not going to beat me to the back. So right. I, the answer to your question is, yeah, I would have beat him to the back. Mookie, what did like the, the kind of not so great thing is after you and Bill became friends, and I know after he died a year or two ago, really affected you. You felt that he was kind of taken to the task, you know, you know a great player, 2,000 hits over, all-star. And we, he went through pure hell in Boston for a couple of years over what happened. I know it really affected you, right? Yeah, Bill and I became, um, you know, more than just, you know, casual friends. Uh, he would call me anytime, uh, day or night. He's going on a fishing trip or whatever, you know, invite me in. We go in and I don't go, hey, I don't go ice fish for anybody. Jay. I don't go ice fish. I don't do that. But Jay, but he was a really good friend. Um, he called me. We talked on family matters. Um, we went to a lot of um, charity events together, and we did a lot of appearances together. Many, many appearances together. Um, and people were surprised to see us together and and be as 
you know, friendly to each other as we were. People expect, I don't know what people expect. They expect us to be just, I guess, at each other's throat. Uh, but we were very, very, very close. Um, as a matter of fact, when he became ill, I was, he called me and informed me when he became ill a couple of years ago. And um, so I knew when no one else knew. And uh, we became that close that he felt comfortable enough to share all those, those private things with me. And we've had just a lot of private conversations about life in general. So yes, he was a very, very good friend and his passing really, really affected me as we're close. Mookie, I don't know if I told you this. I always got, I almost got fired because of you and Bill. After, <laughs> when the Red Sox, Red Sox played the World Series they, in 2004, when he beat the Yankees, whatever, I tweeted something. It was like this, uh, before a Red Sox home game, Mookie's in Fenway Park throwing at the first ball to Buckner all is forgiven. <laughs> and people thought it was for real. Buckner got calls out west. The Red Sox was like, who the hell wrote this? And I got called into the <laughs> office. I said, Jay, you can't do this. You're causing an uproar. <laughs> and I put it, you know, with, you know, Mookie is throwing the first pitch to Buckner, all is forgiven by the Red Sox. And yeah. <laughs> it caused, caused me a lot, a lot of problems, Mookie, but whatever. Well, Those are my wild know, days. But, you know, it, it was funny because, um, when Bill retired, he got a job with Toronto and he called me and, um, you know, asked me to, you know, they put my name in the play. Come on in, let's go, let's coach in Toronto together. Um, and I told him, well, you know, I was kind of committed with the Mets at the time. And, you know, I really, you know, you couldn't do that. Um, and then when Bobby V got the coaching job in Boston, um, Bill was called the interview. And um, he asked, you know, about my you know, also, you know, applying, you know, to try to get a job over there with him. He we really wanted to work together, but it probably wouldn't have been it probably been a PR nightmare. So, <laughs> well, I would like to. It would be great. But, but you know, people forget, Mookie. Everybody looks at this game. It wasn't. It was game six, not game seven. And right. we had to go back the next night, and we're down yeah. three nothing in the middle of the innings and come yeah. back a win. You know, when yeah. people forget about that part, but right? I mean, uh... well, I think people forget about the part. They were up two runs with two outs, and they had their closer on the mound. They had four chances before that ball even was hit. You know, so to put it all on Bill, I think was a disservice. I think, but it's just, I guess, if you ever lose something and you you finally find it, you always find it the last place you look. And I think that was the last thing that people saw, and that just stuck in people's minds. So he became the um. I guess the, the the victim of circumstances there. Yeah, Mookie, what people forget too, when, that was, game six was great. For me, probably the, the best game of all the postseason with game six in Houston. I remember sitting in the locker room, we're losing three nothing to Nepper, just a couple of hits. And nobody, I don't think, wanted to face Mike Scott, who we all thought was scuffing the balls a little bit. And, uh, and then you got a big triple in that ninth inning and we wind up winning the game in 16 innings. I mean, what do you remember about that afternoon? A long, long game. Jay, that game was the game of all games. And um, I tell people that that game probably was more exciting to me than the game, the sixth game in the World Series against Boston because of the way that game was pitched. And, and, and all honestly, and I will say it now, Jay, I thought that Houston team, we – was more of a challenge to us than the Boston game, even though we went seven games with Boston. But I think that we took Boston for granted. We didn't take Houston for granted. We knew that was going to be a challenge when we walked in there. Um, and, you know, because they had one pitcher that, and I hate to use the word fear, but I can't think of any word that will uh, describe it. We, they had one pitcher that we just did not want to face. And that we knew that we had all work cut off for him. And that was Mike Scott. Boston didn't have that guy. You know, even though they had Roger Clemens, Roger Clemens was not the same pitcher as Mike Scott. You know, granted, one is a Hall of Famer and the other is not. But Mike Scott was not the same pitcher as, I mean, you know, as, as Roger Clemens. And Mike Scott really had our number. And to go seven games, we didn't expect to win the one game against Mike Scott. But the rest of the guys, we felt pretty good against. That was my issue. But if you look at that team, per man, we were an even match club. They had speed, they had power, they had pitching. 
Um, I'll pitch in my death lap in a little deeper, but we were a very matched team. So yeah, there was some, that was the one team that was going to challenge us. And when we came out of that series, um, we thought that was, you know, that was, that should have been it, you know, but that was the toughest game I've ever been in, in my life. Yeah. You know, don't, got to don't you think that's I just wanted we, somebody we, to win. Don't you, while we lost the first two games in Boston a little over, you know, hang from the, uh, from the Houston series until you get going after that? I Gee, mean, I have said many times that I, I think that once we beat Houston, we had beaten Houston, that we just took Boston kind of for granted, that we just kind of just like relaxed, you know, say, okay, we, it, from now on it's going to be a cakewalk. And I think that Boston kind of slapped us back to reality that they were a major league ball club as well. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not ashamed to say it now. We just, I think we just took Boston for granted. And um, Boston was a good ball club, but we just didn't see them that way. We didn't see them in the same light as we had viewed Houston. Well, you took you touched on briefly about the team with so many different personalities on the team. You know, you know the the the, the, the Ron Darley, Tintuffle, Daryl, uh, you know Doc, Lenny, Wally, Gary. I mean, how was that team able to blend like that? I mean, win 116 games. You know, this year the Giants won 107, Giants won 106, and we started 108, and we won. And so to win 116 games with that diverse personalities, you know, it's a PR guy. I never knew what to expect. We came to the park that year. I mean, it was always <laughs> something, you know, it was always something, but somehow we won 116 yeah. games. Jay, I was. That is a very good question, and to be honest with you, I was going to answer that very question. I was going to – I said I would never write a baseball book, and I was going to write one about that very same question. But after watching uh, Once Upon a Time in Queens, I decided not to. I think that had been overkill on the 86 team. That team was diverse, and you don't know how – a team is going to mesh. Now, when I say diverse, you're not just talking about, you know, the, you know, the, the age, you're not talking about, you know, you know, the nationalities and the personalities. It's just, just so diverse. And you probably would expect more conflict um, than we did um, within the clubhouse. This is what I'm talking. I'm not talking about other teams within the clubhouse because of that that diversity, but we were able to, you know, to to come together for a common goal, and that was to win. Because there's one thing that we had that no one else had, and that was we had a passion, we had an obsession to beat the St. Louis Cardinals. We wanted to beat St. Louis in the worst way, and I think that was the common thing that brought us all together. Beating the Cardinals was all that matters, and that's you know we deal with everything else. Because the year before that, we won 98 games yes. and didn't make the playoffs. And yes. it wasn't the big the Cardinals at first. In, in April, we went to St. Louis, won four games, and yeah. they never looked back. We just knocked the stuffies yeah. at them in April. Don't you think that series here? Now, you know, um, they always say that at the, the beginning, you, you know, you set a, a presidency. And I think that we set the stage that this is, you know, this is our year and we're going to beat you. And I think. You know, just to watch that team operate, we're totally different teams. They were a team built on the uh, speed and defense, and we were. Built, I think we were more complete. But man to man, they're probably more teams that uh, talent wise, man for man. Look, we had a platoon system in about three positions. Now, what championship club has that? You know, one yes, but not what what shortstop, second base, third base, center field, left field. Man, we were all over the place, but. That's how deep we were. And I, I think that um, that probably would have caused problems with any other club other than that club. Although I do think that it affected us later. Don't you think the team took on Davies' personality, the brashness, you know, going back to spring when he, when he had his famous quote when he said, no, I'm going to win. We're going to dominate the league. I mean, I was in a locker room that time. He says, oh, my God, that's a little bit of pressure <laughs> in, in March, you know. But I think Davies knew what he was doing, right? I mean. Well, you know. <laughs> See, one thing you can't say with David being a fool. David ain't no fool. David knew what he had um, based on 85. And <laughs> any one pitch, you know, one inning away from making it in 85. And um, he knew that that was a very good ball club. That club was on the steps of doing something phenomenal. Um, now, in saying that, no manager will ever say what David said. Not. 
not in good conscience anyway, because you you're setting your team up for failure when you say that kind of stuff. But David wasn't afraid to do it. Can I stop you one second? Right after we said that, I got the papers. I got called to the Frank Cancer <laughs> Jay, why did you let him say that, Jay? You bring him in here. He can't be saying that kind of stuff. Say, Frank, you know, Davey. What am I going to tell him that he can't say that? That's what he believed. <laughs> they were, Frank was so conservative that he he was not a yeah. happy camper when he, when he, when he read, read those quotes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, you know, I knew that, but um, I, I didn't know that you got a call from, from Frank. I Cash, did. You know. But I, no I can imagine there. what people, well, the players themselves, I know I was saying, David, why would you say that? You yeah. know, don't, you know, we had, we felt we had a good club, but you don't say that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it, it was funny, but yeah, he had a, he had a very, uh, his, his personality was very, you know, it was just like the club. He just didn't know what he's going to say. Look, is there one thing you learned from the, from the ESPN film that, you know, once upon a time in Queens, you didn't know, I mean, you have all the guy, you know, the, the interviews. Is there anything that struck you is different, or you know, hey, I didn't know that, or that's interesting. I mean, any you know, any one one thing. Well, you know, the the, the one couple of things. Um, the only thing that I didn't know, uh, two things. Well, one thing was uh, some of the little things that happened during certain games. Okay, that happened. I can't expect to remember all that kind of stuff. Um, but the one thing that probably I did not know, and that was um, why we didn't retain Ray Knight, you know. Um, and I know, I mean, you always knew that we probably had contractual money. You know, that what normally happens and stuff like that. You know, um, guy wins the MVP and stuff like that. So it's always about contracts. Um, and I, I just thought that um, the Mets were ready to move on uh, from Ray Freighton. From Ray, I did not know that he had a conversation with, you know, Frank Cashin before, you know, the parade and all that kind of stuff. No, I didn't know that, you know. So, do you remember the first time you and I met? I mean, you know, I, I joined the Mets in uh, in April of 80. I think you came up in September of 80. We went to you when they came yeah. So I'm looking as a PR guy, looking for the different angles to write, you know, write about Doug playing, playing the guitar, you know, Joe Young, Black Hunting, Craig Swan being a trainer. I said, Mookie, how did you get the name of Mookie? And you I never, remember that, Jay. And you never yeah. really said, I, did you tell me that I make this up? Because you couldn't pronounce milk? I mean, was Jay. That, was, Jay. That, that's not, I don't remember the whole, it was something to do with milk. Was it? Well, first, first of all, I told you I didn't know how yeah. I got the name. So I made that up. I yeah, think. Yes, you did. You made it up. It sounded good. Yeah, people, exactly. I know how you got your name. wrong with it, right? Yeah, nothing well, wrong with it, Jay. Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't say no, but I didn't. Yeah. I don't know. Well, that is Mookie Blaylock. <laughs> Remember, we had when the Red Sox came into you, and Mookie Betts wanted to meet you. You know, with yeah. the state when you were coaching there. Now, is Mookie yeah. Blaylock, Mookie Betts? You remember, are there any other Mookies that you know of? Or? Um, not that I've met. I have got many letters of people that have named their kids Mookie. Um. Also, a bunch of cats, a bunch of dogs, a bunch of turtles, and everything else. But, <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> yeah. but uh, no, I, I have not met anyone. Um, I met, um, I met, I met, I met a, 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 a family who named their daughter. Middle name is Mookie. Really? But no. Yeah, but wow. that's about it. Yeah. M Mookie, two things. Thank you for your time, and I've known you for forty years, and as good a player are you are, are you a hundred times better person and a friend. And it me, it's been an honor to know you so long and, and consider yourself me, I mean you friends and fraternity, my friend. Thank you for your time and I really appreciate it, Mook. Yeah, no problem, Jay. Anytime you know that, man. Hey, friends for life, man. You got that right, Mookie.